Speaker, uh, we have three guests from the University of Washington, and as many of you know, out of courtesy, rather than wear cougar wear like you did, actually wore satellite themed. Uh, and uh, I'd like to uh, introduce Paige Norway, who is a Northway, sorry, who is an Earth and Space Science graduate student pursuing her PhD. Uh, and Paige, I apologize, I didn't find out your piece on the aircraft? Uh, I'm the propulsion. Propulsion. OK, so you're the one that's going to talk about the thing that most enthralls me. Um, and Paul Stumer, who is a physics graduate student pursuing his PhD. And Paul, my understanding, you're kind of partially responsible for the amateur radio um, uh, aspects of the, the satellite. Yep, so I helped integrate one of the radios from AMSAT that they provided to us, and then I also developed the 24 gigahertz beacon. Okay, so really for once the, the original mission is completed, one of the, the things that the amateur radio community, at least the amateur satellite community, needs to keep in mind, we should be thankful for your efforts, correct? Uh, if it works. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think for a lot of people, the try is, is just as important. And then uh, last but not least is Nathan Wacker. Sorry, I yes. need new glasses, so it's like, this is, well, I guess I can do that. Yes. There we go. <laughs> He's a computer science uh, undergraduate student pursuing his uh, Bachelor of Science, uh, also at the U, and your piece on this is? Uh, I did a lot of work on the flight software as well as the ground station software, and I'm currently in charge of operations. Neat. Me. Uh, so, uh, how about a warm, a warm round of applause for our? And, uh, thank you. I'm paper is so old-fashioned. <laughs> Yes. Thank you. Sure. The introduction. Um, just to put names and faces together one more time, we have five to do that, and then um, if it is desired, we can potentially send this presentation out later um, if people want to want to have a copy of it. So yeah, we'd love that. You will have that. Um, yeah. So CubeSats, I am not super familiar with your group. So is everyone familiar with the idea of what a CubeSat is, more or less, how they came about? Um, so we're going to throw a lot of CubeSat terminology around later. So this is going to be considered a one U CubeSat. So it's approximately 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters, which is where you get the cube name. And so the CubeSat, even when you get into more of a three U configuration, so you have approximately three of these stacked together and it is no longer a cube, uh, we still call it a CubeSat. Uh, and so that's where that terminology comes from. Um, and the, the CubeSat, the idea is that it's a, it's a standard, uh, so universities, groups can build things to a particular standard and a single type of launcher can then deploy them and that brings down the cost of, of doing these launches quite a bit. Uh, and you can see in, in the graph uh, since 2000 is when they really started uh, launching CubeSats and there's just been a lot of growth and then this only goes up to 2017. Um, but 2018, I think, saw the most CubeSats launched. Uh, and then 2019 was a little bit of a slump, but they predict something on a couple hundred once you include both university and, and private companies. Um, excuse me. Uh, the, the sort of poster child for, for private company involvement in CubeSats is Planet, uh, which is coming out of California. They very briefly had an office in Redmond, I think, but nothing came of that. But they launched, I think it's 300 CubeSats of, of approximately this size. Um, they're Dove Constellation, and they're doing things like imaging all of the Earth in very high resolution every 24 hours. Um, so there's a lot of interesting applications that are coming out of um, even tiny satellites like this. The very first CubeSats that were launched were like CubeSat. Like they'd go up and they launched and they make noise and everyone would celebrate. Um, as, as time has gone on, a lot of, a lot of things have become miniaturized. Um, the CubeSats are now doing real science. Uh, and not only just in low Earth orbit, but then also in, in cislunar orbit or going out to Mars. Um, some CubeSats that are about twice the size uh, have been proposed to end and some of them tested in, in 
not low Earth orbits. So, so CubeSat is a really kind of an exciting thing in the space community right now. Uh, and, and the MSAT group has several that are up that they're involved in as well. Um, I think that kind of covers what I was going to talk about there. Uh, so I can pass this around if anyone wants to see. This is just a 3D printed version of, of a 1U CubeSat. Uh, you guys can pass this around too. Um, this is an actual size model of HuskySat. Um, solar panels on the actual HuskySat don't deploy, uh, but the actual HuskySat looks more like this. Um, but these ones you can see kind of inside our, our board stack, and we'll talk more about that later. Uh, um, so the CubeSat team at University of Washington began the launch of Professor Robert Wingley's Advanced Proposal Laboratory. Um, that's where Paul and I got started working on, on CubeSat. So the, the propulsion system has been something we've been working on in the lab for, for quite a while, and the idea was we wanted to get it tested in space. Um, Paul and I actually started looking into the technology that eventually became the, the 24 gigahertz radio and the, basically the the format for the for the propulsion system by looking at trying to do something called NASA's Lunar Cube Quest Challenge, which is that, that idea of sending a 6U CubeSat into orbit around the moon and communicating back. Uh, and I'll, I'll touch on that again in a minute. But we didn't actually end up doing that, but instead we managed to get funding through uh, NASA USIP program, NASA Undergraduate Student Instrument Program. Um, and so that funneled us into the CubeSat launch initiative, which is where we were able to get launched with. Um, so NASA paid for our launch, which was very nice. Uh, and the team, I think right now the team is composed of 30 undergrads and two grad students. Uh, over the course of the whole project, we probably had 60 to 80 undergrads who had a meaningful contribution to the satellite program. Uh, so it's been, it's been a really good learning experience for a lot of students at, at the University of Washington. Uh, and then just for fun, I, I ended up putting together a timeline. We actually proposed the project through the, the NASA UZIP program four years before the launch. Um, and so that proposal happened, we got accepted, uh, following spring, and then they didn't actually have a kickoff meeting until almost a year later because we were working with NASA. Uh, and, um, and then when that, that kickoff meeting happened, happened they funded us in the CubeSat launch initiative. We went through several uh, review sessions um, and actually uh, changed it from what you see there to one with without deployable solar panels and changed several things we'll talk about later. Uh, we delivered it, and I'll talk about this. Um, in August of this year, we took it down to Houston and put it in a box. Uh, it got launched in space in November, no, November 2nd, and then finally deployed uh, on, oh, that's wrong. Oh, yeah, January. Um, not January 20th, January 31st of 2020. Uh, and just for uh, a little kind of a fun thing, I thought our original proposal for that lunar CubeSat that was going to go to the moon and communicate back. Uh, we, we had budgeted ourselves what is that, less than three years to deliver a very big group of that. Um, and, and so you can see kind of <coughs> how our timelines and our project scope changed throughout that. But we were very optimistic throughout the whole thing. Um, and, so and so this is just sort of a, how, the, how the satellite got into space. Um, we put it in a metal box, which we put in a plug in case, which I then checked. Um, or carried on to, to uh, an airplane. airplane. That was very exciting. I've actually, I was really worried about going through security. And <laughs> yeah. I had all these papers and I was ready and I was like, I had an ESD bracelet, like, take it out. And um, turns out there is no one in the airport at six on a Saturday. So like, I'm trying to get someone to like acknowledge that I have a weird thing in everything. And I'm like, oh, talk to the next person, talk to the next person. So I'm like, you know, like the, the x ray machine. And I like, gently set it on. And there's Four guys standing around because there's no one going through security. You kind of look at me and like, okay, I have a satellite. <laughs> if you need me to, I can take it out of this box, but I can't take it out of the other box. Like, what do we need to do? You're like, oh, cool. What do I do? And then go over to the box and go to your next 
So, so if we wanted to smuggle 100 pounds of cocaine through, that's well, you essentially told like, us exactly how to do it. Uh, on that X-ray machine. Thank you. But that was the best that I've ever been through. Um, and then so we installed the satellite in here, uh, down in Houston. Then, and that was with called Manorak. Uh, and then Manorak shipped the box up to Virginia. Um, and that big white box the, the blanket on, on the box. So that box is where we wrote space. Um, we were in there uh, at the launch. And so this is this is the fitness capsule. Uh, at launch, we were in the VIP section. Uh, we were closer than anyone else, which still means that you're two and a half miles away. Uh, and so you can kind of see right there. Canaveral? <laughs> this is Canaveral? Uh, no, no, we were uh, Nessa Welps. Okay. Um, so, uh, Virginia. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, yeah, so it was actually sort of like what Addie was there asking about. about. You, you could, could still feel, feel like the vibrations of the launch, and it was very exciting, exciting but you got, got there, and you're like, oh, there it is. <laughs> I thought we were going to be a lot closer. Uh, but it was very, very exciting. Very, very exciting, exciting launch. launch. And then we went into space. Uh, there's the Cygnus capsule, and again, there's our little box. Um, so when, you, when the Cygnus capsule was docking with the ISS and they had the live feed, you could kind of watch it and be like, oh yeah, there's the box, we're still in it. Um, and then finally, I, I had to get explicit permission to use this photo, but this is the box that we were in. Um, and the door opened and there are two satellites here and then our satellite was here all by itself. And you can see up in the corner yeah. there's a husky cat um, moving right into the shadow on the solar panel. Uh, so that was pretty exciting when we got this picture. They figured that aim out. To Jimmy. And it works. <laughs> <laughs> so that was sort of the scary part of this whole thing is that because the Cygnus module was docked at the ISS, it went up into space and then sat at the ISS, I mean, for a couple months, was it? Three months? Yeah. And so it wasn't until the end of January, uh, so two weeks ago, that we finally got this thing deployed and got first contact with it. So everybody says, oh, is the launch exciting? You know, here, the whole time I'm just crossing my fingers waiting for this thing to actually turn on and not just be a space brick. Very, very fancy space brick, mind you. Um, and so at the 1st of February, we were able to make contact with it. And everybody was really excited. We got a lot of alumni back in the lab. So here's a photo. Um, and we were finally able to hear it and confirm that all of our engineering in fact, uh, paid off. And then one of the coolest parts for me, because you can hear it and you can see it, but the, the first cool thing to tell that it was really working is here's some data from a whole bunch of orbits of the satellite. And it's not necessarily important what the what these data are, but you can you can see the cyclic nature of this. So you can see the battery charge, and the battery gets drained in the eclipse. It gets charged in the sun and drained again. And so we can see that this thing is healthy and that everything is maintaining itself across the orbits. And, and you can see because we're slightly tumbling that in eclipse nothing's being generated, but the panel power is all there. And, and here we know we've, we've built a healthy satellite. We can we can continue with the mission. So speaking of which. We, so we made first contact and we just had a had a very small beacon on there and the, the first step was we enabled continuous transmission mode so if you're following the the mode that's sort of what we were doing today and the, the mode that we commanded into and when you see that little beacon is what we started out with and then we command it into the, to the health mode and get continuous data um and then after that we commissioned the power system to make sure everything checked out and i should mention by the way the fact that we're able to get such fantastic data is was not just through our station um because of our partnership with ansat which i think paul will talk a bit more about later we were able to uh, leverage data from all the other MSET stations that are uploading to a common server. And so in that way, we're actually able to have, through the amateur community, a whole network of ground stations at our disposal versus ours. So, I mean, if we would have just seen a very faint signal, we might not have known anything. But, but through that, we were able to really paint a very good picture of the health of our spacecraft. Uh, anyway, so we commissioned the power system, and we confirmed that everything was good. We saw the battery was charging. We saw that we were getting a nominal six watts. Uh, and, and the next step, step the, the next low risk mission objective was to commission the camera. camera. So we'll, that's, that's something that Adi worked on. We'll chat about, about a bit more yeah. later. Um, so, so we, we still, still have a lot more going on. The mission we have next to commission the verifier attitude control system. Um, so, so using the Earth's magnetic field to detumble us right now, we're just very slowly spinning. You can see that in the, the panel power graphs. Um, and then we also have some more sensors on there that we have not turned on yet. Uh, as well as we have an auxiliary flight controller using some advanced, uh, more advanced control systems. Uh, we have that, the Twitter for Gigahertz transponder, which I'm all sure you're very excited about. That's Paul's radio. Uh, and we have to fire the thruster, last of all, is, is Paige's propulsion unit. 
How do you um, use the Earth's magnetic field to slow the spin down? So, so um, I, can I can talk more about this when we talk about the controller, but the idea is that in low Earth orbit, you're low enough to actually measure and, and feel the effects of the magnetic field. So what you do is you use what's called magnetorquers. So it's just like electromagnets, basically. And as you um, as you uh, excite the electromagnets, they you get a force, you get the cross product of the force of the Earth's magnetic field, so therefore you're able to exert a torque on the satellite. And but pulse them on? It, or are they on all the time? Um, it depends on your control well, modes. So we actually have, uh, for safety, we have like a sort of permanent magnet simulation built in. Oh, okay. I know a lot of CubeSats do passive ADCS, and they just have a magnet in there. But um, ours actually uses just a, a sort of basic control algorithm to, to sort of minimize the, the velocity relative to the Earth's magnetic field. So it is just like sort of a pulsed thing, but it's a very controlled pulse. Right, OK. And then, so just to add to that, so between the pulses, we have the magnetometer which measures the magnetic field. So the whole intent is you want to generate a magnetic field such that you're you're providing a torque on the spacecraft that's slowing it down rotationally. So if you turn on the magnetic torquers and you can turn them off, and then you measure the magnetic field, and you kind of just repeat that. That's true. It does have to be pulsed, because otherwise it's very hard to accurately measure the field. Um, so, so, you know, yeah, so we've got these systems that contribute to this mission success. We've got COM2, again, the radio, we've got COM1. So this is, we've got two communications units. COM1 is, or COM2 rather, is the more experimental unit. And uh, COM1 uh, is the integration with AMSAT. Um, we also have the ADCS system, kind of what we talked about, but with the addition of some, of some additional sensors and the second flight computer and the camera, which is an outreach payload with Razebeck and, and Audi. Um, as well as the power systems, that's the, the graphs that I was showing you earlier of the solar panel, power generation, power storage, power distribution, um, and then the propulsion unit finally on the bottom. And here, here is a, a more exploded view. view. So this is sort of the, the cool render of this uh, with just a bit more detail. So the things that you can see here now are the hash antenna for the COM2 sitting on top. So I, I, don't, I don't believe that's in that model, but it's here. We also have the uh, ISIS dipole UHF VHF antenna. So I believe it stood for industrial system, something something in Stations solutions space. in space. Yeah. Uh, uh, named quite a while ago, obviously. Um, and so, so those, those are the antennas we're using. So uh, UHF, UHF down, VHF up. Uh, we also have the AMSAT linear transponder. So it's, it's a, both a communications unit as well as when we turn it over to AMSAT, it will become uh, an amateur radio linear transponder. Um, and, and like these, so these are the magnet targets here. These are the wound coils that you were asking about earlier that, that we, can, we can do that with. Um, also, our, our batteries, more on that later, we've got uh, two, uh, two, yeah, rather four uh, batteries that get us a total of. Uh, I'll go into the, the specs when we get into that. Exactly, exactly here. here. Um, <laughs> so we've got, we are using the lithium phosphate batteries, which I, I believe those are the same batteries that were in the, the cell phones that were causing all those issues. Is that, um, no? Not, Not quite. quite. <laughs> all right. They, they caused us uh, some, some similar things, some shipping and testing and whatnot. Um, so not, not exactly the same thing, but the thing that it does get us is it gets us a lot of cycles and it gets us a lot of storage. And so that's what the health of the power system is really what, what contributes to all the other sort of more high power payloads, um, like the thruster and COM2 and, and the camera, which is using a lot more power than sort of the nominal electronics. But our panels are, are doing quite a good job, even with the, the non-deployables. So with the deployable panels, you, you can face it towards the sun and potentially get more power. But even with the three, three sides of panels, we're getting a, like a nominal six watts in the sun is over the whole mission is what we're about what we're doing. Um, so here, this is sort of a, the actual satellite like you were saying before. You can see the panels here with this sort of red, I don't remember what this compound we ended up using was, this sort of like red epoxy-ish. RTV. Yeah, yeah like um, RTV as well as the render of the battery sitting there on the PCB in the stack. And, and so, so again, to the ADCS, yeah. so, so we have a VDOT controller, which is basically minimizing the, your, your velocity, your V dot um, of the Earth's magnetic field, so, so detumbling effectively. Uh, we've got three axis magnet torques. We have very full controls, just not necessarily very quickly, um, as well as uh, several MSP430, just a TI MCU that comprise this more complex control system. And they talk across the CAN bus, which is the Sheriff bus that I'll talk about a bit later. Um, so we do have, yeah, like I said, the VDOT controller, and, and as I mentioned before, um, we can just basically simulate a permanent magnet ADCS system, so an attitude determination and control system. As, as what most systems would use, it's just a passive so to, to align, align you with, with the field. field. Uh, so, so in the case of an, uh, the, the controller fails or something shorts, we can just revert to that mode. Um, and to do that, we did a lot of hardware in the loop testing because this is a control algorithm that was um, developed at a, a controls lab at the AA department of our school that we worked with. Um, so we have this big old electromagnet right here, and we can, in very sort of um, 
We can swing it around. <laughs> and so we can simulate the tumbling in the Earth magnetic field. We can watch all the graphs on the computer and watch it try and actuate and slow that down. And in the simulation, then we can we can simulate the conditions of that. And there was there was a lot of work that went into that and verifying that that worked. Um, so I mentioned the camera module, and I'm sure this audience is very excited to see this. It was an outreach payload through Razorback Aviation High School in collaboration with Adi and a couple other folks. Um, I guess, well, I guess they were they're going to school. They're all in, they're all they're all in college now, but um, they, worked they worked very hard on this. This is Raspberry, Raspberry Pi integrated with camera, bu uh, can bus rather, using, using a Raspberry Pi camera module, and, and we finally got some low res pictures of the Earth. <laughs> so we, we know vaguely that it's not flat, um, but, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but not much else beyond that. Although it, I must say it, is, it does feel very cool to have built something that's gone up into space and then taken such pictures. And thank you, Adia, uh, for, for rendering these out of the, of the data there. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, we, yeah, we faked the, faked the satellite launch. Um, <laughs> So, so as you might be able to sort of glean a bit from this, we did more of like a decentralized architecture, so not fully distributed. I don't know if anybody's done that on a satellite. That would be cool, but I feel like impossible. Um, but we have the idea of this is that if there's rate events due to radiation failure or, or due to other factors um, that certain systems can fail, we can just shut them off, and those won't affect the, the mission success of the others. Um, so we have a total of nine TI MSB430 microcontrollers. Uh, two, two Raspberry, Raspberry Pis, so one of those is running the camera, camera and one of those is running Paul's radio. radio. Uh, there are 12, 12 total nodes because the other node on that bus is, um, is, is the AMSAT, AMSAT uh, COM1 unit. So over that, that uh, communication with bus, it's, it's really resilient to, to radiation and disturbance. Uh, a lot of industry is using this, but I believe we're the first university to do so. Um, so, so something more like I2C, we can, we can we're able to use the CAN bus. We still have those on the satellite. We're able to use the CAN bus as a fallback to potentially reset those in a very safe, very resilient way. Um, and, so, and so, yeah, like like it's here, you, for instance, like we're talking about the magnet torpers, we're tumbling at a very a good rate. So if something shorts in the controller, we're able to shut that off and potentially still achieve success on other things. I, I don't think that will happen, but that's that's part of the architecture here. If that central node fails, all, All those other nodes around it are on their own. Yeah, yeah it's, it's not a it's not a perfect system. So there, there are, are definitely single point failures. failures. The, the idea is that you don't um, you don't, don't have as many single point failures ideally. ideally. So, so we, have we have like one sort of, sort of the power distribution board or, or the comms unit might be this sort of central, central node. Um, so we have to build those systems very robustly, but then we, we can. can um, we can sort of take take liberties or, or make it a bit easier, especially since this is like an undergrad development project. This also helps a lot with this, the element of getting students involved, because if you have one very central system, like one flight computer that takes all the sensors and does all the actions, it's a lot harder to develop that hardware and software-wise. So now you can get even more undergrads on the team to develop cooler software. I mean, like with the outreach payload, is, is you just you can get more people involved, and that that's just better for everybody with the, with the experience. Um, so, so, but yeah, like you said, it's there's a lot of software precautions and hardware precautions I know that on those central nodes. But there's there's fundamentally nothing you can really, really do about that. Maybe there's cool research out there, but nothing out there. Oh. So, the, oh, oh, this is rather modular. There's something that we can we can do that's really, really cool. So we start out with the sort of breakout boards of the components. Like here, this is one for our uh, their MCU plus CAN uh, layout that's on all of the chips. Or almost, or almost all the chips, with except for the Raspberry Pis. But, but you have all these very modular boards that stack up on these rails as part of the final satellite. satellite. And you can kind of see that in this model. If you look through, they're just unpopulated boards. Um, but we're able to actually take them apart and lay them out very flat in the engineering stages. So we have what's called the flat sat. And so those are just a whole bunch of boards chained together, electrically connected, just as you would in the full satellite. But if, but if something goes wrong, it allows us to probe in there, you know, like a UART probe or, or actually multimeter probe. Um, as well as, well as like swing the magnet, magnet over and do the hardware in the loop things and, and actually for the engineering models we were able to spoof the sensor inputs and so that's that really allows us to do a lot, a lot better testing there and then eventually we move to the, the tower set configuration so, so more of a flight configuration so we lose a bit of debug but we're able to exercise our ground station we're able to exercise operations that way and finally we, we do the final flight assembly with all of the flight actual flight boards seal it up and in that, that stage, we're able to do just the final checkout check and, and deliver it. Oh, this is a black stand, but. <laughs>
Um, so we did lose a few things along the way, as you can kind of see, we have a, a few things, if you don't mind. Um, so notably, the, the deployable solar panels here, as well as the, the COM2 reflect array. So these are two deployables um, that didn't make it into the final version. Um, so the, the key point being the, the uh, reaction wheels. So reaction wheels are another way you can do attitude determination and control, or more accurately, attitude control. Um, so that way you can siphon your rotational inertia to a wheel. Uh, and then very, very quickly, very accurately, if you do your controls, point your satellite. And so that a lot of our, our mission was sort of dependent on that. We were going to do velocity pointing, so pointing in the direction of our orbit. And so when you fired the thruster, it would, it would very directly raise the orbit versus being more of a tech demo, um, as well as doing ground pointing for a very directional uh, CON2 unit. And so unfortunately, in our, our, our environmental testing and our vibe testing, uh, thermal testing, we found that those wheels did not survive vibe. And so we could have continued with that, but it doesn't make sense to fly something that this can potentially going to be faulty to the detriment of the mission. So because we lost the wheels, um, also the hinges bound up during that vibe testing, we found that they deployed, we reset them, put them to the vibe, uh, and then deployed them again, and they just didn't deploy. So we had to scrap that. And so yeah, the count two reflect arrays in the same boat is if we can't, we don't have the exact fine attitude control, we, we, we don't want to have the COM2 be so directional that we'll never hear from it, whereas now, now it's, it's far less directional and we'll be able to, to exercise that uh, in, in the future. future. So, so this is all sort of the ground station work that I do, but this, the, the cool, cool part, part that I mentioned earlier is that we have this whole ground station of AMSAT networks, uh, AMSAT, AMSAT, or this network of AMSAT ground stations that go to their central server, and so that way we're able to collect that data through FOXLAM and it's this uh, ball aerospace software we use called Cosmos. Um, and parse, and parse the data, data and use that to operate our on our mission on our ground station using uh, everybody's network. Uh, and then from our station, we do we have a single point of uplink. We can uplink, and, and a lot of our stuff goes directly onto the CAN bus. So it transitions very well from the development stage to the flight stage. Because whereas we were plugged directly into the CAN bus transmitting on that bus, we now have the AMSAT communications unit. We worked with them a lot to get this functionality of just sending a CAN packet and having it being immediately on the satellite bus. Um, there's, There's a lot, lot more there, but that gives you the sort of the gist, gist of that. So you're saying they uplink as well, or just you guys uplink? Oh, oh no. no. So we um, we are the only station that's licensed to uplink, and Paige did all the licensing. So if you have specific, please. Uh, <laughs> that sounds horrible. <laughs> oh, we'll be talking at dinner. <laughs> so um, yeah, so we 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 are the only station that's licensed to, to uplink, but there are sort of two sets of commands. Like I, so we've got our we've got, we've got our piece that we developed sort of underneath there. theirs, and we can forward packets, packets along our bus. Well, we also do have commands that affect the operation of COM1, adjusting the transmit mode. Um, um, that's, that's pretty much all we, we do regularly, um, but just altering the function that. But the rest of the packets just get, get forwarded across the bus. Um, but I, again, that's, that all comes through us. For now. For now. Oh, oh yeah, so that's true. Until AMSAT, until we turn it over to AMSAT, in which case it then becomes a, like an amateur transponder. So then it's, that's, that's just for the part five. That, that link is what's considered the sensitive uplink. So that link, people don't have access to that. Right. Um, so the transponder is something else. Okay. So, okay. so the plasma thruster was the, the, the team that I led. I'll actually do a lot of the electronics work for it, but um, I did some of, the, some of the early research for it. Uh, it's a it's a solid fuel thruster, which is really good for things like CubeSats because they're usually secondary payloads. So um, if you're flying on something like the Cygnus capsule or going to the International Space Station, uh, they really don't want you to have anything that could possibly blow up. Uh, special vessels are, are just right out. Um, it's changing. Uh, batteries. We have to test the heck out of the batteries too. Yeah. Um, so, so, yeah, so, yeah, it's a simple and robust design. It's actually been used on larger, larger satellites, satellites uh, going back as far as the 1960s uh, for, for attitude control um, because, because they can, can they're a pulse system, so you can deliver a tiny little precise bit of impulse and you flip the satellite just a little bit. bit. Um, but because they're simple and solid, fuel, and robust, we thought it would be a good plan for being a pulse of CubeSat uh, in space, and there's a lot of paperwork behind that. Anyway, but uh, but we got it on on a flight. Um, and so the, the interesting work that we did for the thruster, uh, I guess first I'll tell you how it works. Um, so there's two electrodes with a full plasma thruster, and you store energy at a high voltage across your main bank of capacitors. Um, so we're looking at a kilovolt 
on 20 joules of capacitance. So, so we're, we're operating at 10 joules of energy, energy per pulse. Um, the distances, the distances that our electrodes are apart, kilo -volt of, 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 um, of voltage is just going to sit there. Uh, and, and so, so you need an igniter uh, and then use a high voltage strip of transformer uh, to, to basically seed electrons into there. And then they see this high electric field and then they start the, the breakdown. What happens when all this energy breaks down across the surface of your propellant? is it ablates and ionizes some, some of that pond. So, so every time you fire it, there's this little path of uh, plasma that comes out, out basically. And we're talking about micrograms, tens of micrograms per pulse. Um, um, so that, that, that's basically how it works. Um, what we wanted to do with, with, with the thruster is to take it in a direction where we get a little bit higher thrust for power input, because it's something we're literally limited to CubeSats. Um, it has these tiny little solar panel areas, uh, and so you don't have a lot of power. And you typically, if you're in a low Earth orbit, you don't have a whole lot of lifetime. Um, and so we wanted to we wanted to increase the thrust output for power input, which is not usually what you're looking for in an electric propulsion system. Um, sort of the gold standard for for previous things is your ISP is basically how fast your fuel is coming out. If your fuel is being exhausted faster, then you need less of it to accelerate to a certain speed. Um, and, and so we sort of we took it in a different direction with our research, um, and that resulted in us uh, going with instead of Teflon, which is the fuel that's been used in the past, we ended up using solid sulfur fuel. Um, and so we actually like make molds as a of sulfur flux that we put in the in the thruster, and that actually gave us about a two x um, increase in specific thrust over the over the Teflon. So that was kind of a, a big win for us. And then we also ended up using you can kind of see this like. We call them daisy. It's a serrated geometry, which allows us to have, have a bigger surface area and still break down at the same voltages. Uh, uh, we did have on the next side have a uh, model of it, but um, we did get it down to a six U plus form factor. factor. So, so this, this is five. This is about five centimeters. So it's half of, of one, of, one those of those plus the two. The, this is the technical term: is a two mechan extension. Um, <laughs> and so that's where the cubule is. That's where the cubule is. Uh, I don't know how that got to be the technical term. But, um, so, that, so that so so the all of the fuel is in that extension. It is. Um, so here's just what it looks like. Um, so this is what it looks like all put together. This is this is our um, fuel puck. I think we have like 50 grams of sulfur, a little bit more than that. Um, that they all get stored. Yeah, right in that. And that's another great thing about solid propellant. You have a high uh, storage. About how many? Um, pulses can it can that fuel? Um, so no less than half a million. Okay. So you have some pretty good con life, a pretty good control. Yeah. Um, so the design, the original design, when we still had very big aspirations, um, was that we were going to raise the orbit um, with the the maybe 50 meter per second delta B. Um, and, and so, so that if we we're when we were still, still going to be able to point accurately for long periods of time, um, we were going to pulse it with high frequency, frequency you know, for like, like a third of the orbit for, uh, you know, once every other second. And um, that raises it from what uh, orbit altitude to what orbit altitude? Um, to Not a whole lot. Um, <laughs> I mean, well, so it depends on what altitude you start at. I'm sorry? It depends on what altitude you start at. Um, and and where, where where that altitude are we talking about? So, so I mean, we knew well. We didn't, we didn't actually know where we were going to get dropped off for a very long time. We ended up getting dropped off at 465 kilometers. Um, so uh, don't quote me on this because I don't know, but maybe. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's in a couple of the uh, But yeah, a couple. A couple of kilometers. Tens of kilometers, yeah. I think. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, so the, the, that this amount of delta V that this was designed for, um, it 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 prolongs your mission more yeah. than anything. So normally, if you don't do anything, you're gonna come. You don't down decay. With, with right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah you'll, so you're getting from about four hundred and uh, uh, fifty kilometers up to maybe four eighty or something like that. Yeah, tens, yeah. a few low tens of. Or, 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 or you keep it 450 like, like 10 years. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so the satellite is probably going to come down in three years. Just, just, the satellite is probably going to come down in three years. 
just based exactly. off the, the amount of drag there is in your brain. Um, what happens is it's going to burn up or? Yeah. Except, Except for, for the tungsten. tungsten. It turns out if you're building a satellite, don't use tungsten. <laughs> um, it doesn't burn up. So, so we had to go through, through actually, <laughs> this is one of the great things about going through NASA was they had like one of their official people do an like, analysis to make sure that the tungsten wasn't going to come down with too much energy, but it is going to come down. Uh, <laughs> Most of the Earth is ocean. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> and when it comes down, people are going to be excited about finding that. But yeah, the little they will. They will. They're yeah. Uh, Just like hunting meteors. It's true. Um, yeah, the rest of the the propulsion system all fits on these three boards. Um, our high voltage capacitors and our ignition coil um, are here, and then we try. This is a very very electrically noisy system. Um, I mean, you're basically short yeah. everything. Yeah, the spark, um, yeah, sparky. And so, <laughs> spark, spark, it's better. <laughs> uh, and so we tried to set it up in a way, which is why it kind of looks weird, where it's the only part where the boards go all the way out to the edge. Um, because we tried to set up basically little Faraday cages hmm. the whole way along. Um, and so then we have our, our charging electronics up here. So this steps up to the high voltage, and this is the board with the, the microcontroller on it. And if this works, will it work? Oh, yeah. um, so this is a super, it, it's very, very fancy camera. Um, the pulsing is the an artifact of the camera, but that's a video of the thruster firing. Um, Real time? And, like, this has be crazy high frames. Yeah. yeah. Like, I think you can get, get two million frames per second. Yeah. Like, <laughs> frames per second or something. Okay. It's a high speed. Yeah, yeah it's, it's a really, really, really fancy high speed camera. So it's, it's just, just kind of cool to see how they discharge. And that was in orbit or yeah. or down here? <laughs> oh, yeah, that was uh, that was the yeah, Somebody yeah. stood behind it. It's a great camera. Yeah. Yeah. Great yeah. camera. <laughs> Spacewalk and they hung over. Yeah, that's just the one way. Yeah. Yeah. Their, their phone. <laughs> how far away were you when your iPhone? Okay, communication stuff now. Um, so, so there's COM1 and COM2. So COM1 is a radio provided by AMSAT, and then we purchase a commercial antenna, so that ISIS module. Um, so this is a company where we just bought the antenna thinking that we're going to have a reliable system cons consisting of the AMSAT radio plus this antenna. And then everything else we build in the satellite, as long as we provide the power, then you know, you know we could you know fail and we'd still have a beeper sat. So that plan worked well, except for the fact that ISIS that didn't come through as well as we thought it would. So we had some issues with getting an antenna that just didn't perform from an RF point of view. Um, but we made it work. So we actually launched our engineering model of the ISIS antenna, um, which isn't ideal, but but that got through. So. A couple, a couple of features. features. Um, so this, this is, is going to be the first amateur satellite, I believe, that is a linear transponder versus just an FM repeater. So there's, there's going to be an entire pass band that essentially comes up on UHF and it comes down on VHF, and then there's going to be you know channelization within within that band of for, for not the users. first, not the first the CubeSat. So okay, could be the first CubeSat. Yes. Okay. Um, and then. Um, then, then there's, there's the telemetry downlink, downlink which is a DPSK modulated downlink, and that, that's always continuously um, uh, outputting. Um, so right now there's stations picking that up. Um, so, so that you can actually see in ampsat.org slash TLM. Um, and then the program for that is this box telemetry. So it's an open source um, software, and then you can use, you know, it's compatible with a lot of different radios. Um, and then there's also an uplink. Um, which we're using to to command the radio a little bit to different modes, and then we forward camp uh, camp packets, um, and then um, that's the the basics with that. Any questions before? It's inverted. Yes. Yep. 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 So the frequencies are. My brain, My brain was trying to process. Yeah. Eight forty. Eight ten. It's like lower sideband. Like side you know. Literally, <laughs> yeah. it is. Yeah. I understand. But, but it's, it's inverted, so it hears high and traps yeah. slows. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. Okay. okay. So, so when Pedro and I started working on that lunar project, 
NASA, NASA was trying to promote development, development technological development in propulsion and communication systems. So that's where you know we had that the we had the PPT at the time, and then we started doing the communication work. So um, then and now, there's not really a good market for CubeSat high frequency communication um, stuff. So and especially not like open source. So so I started this project, um, and essentially it's, it's a, a it's they transmit, transmit only, only and there's emphasis on the RF aspect. So, so I did as little as possible in the baseband, the low frequency. Um, so the system works by having a, a Raspberry Pi 3, um, the little, uh, the DDR2 compute module variation. And then that goes to a B200 um, um, software defined radio, which is, you know, a couple of, you know, two by three inches. Um, and then that's our and TX, so I just pull just the TX off. Um, and then that runs new radio to, to just give me around two gigahertz baseband. So then the RF front end uh, up converts to 24 gigahertz, and then so it's 24.049 is the allocation um, to center frequency, and then it power amplifies it to about uh, one watt. Um, and then that goes to a four element feed antenna. So that feed antenna is shown here, um, just four little patch elements that are circularly polarized, um, and then the reflector, the reflector ray, maybe, I didn't put a picture, picture maybe it'll go back. Yeah, yeah there's one in the way back. Yeah, yeah, maybe. Is the W on the reflector ray part of the secret sauce that Price. goes into the antenna? Unfortunately not. Uh, so, the <laughs> four well, well, I still, I still put printing it. Yeah, yeah. So, you, so you, yeah, 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 University of Washington did not like us putting a logo <laughs> down places, which is kind of odd. But, but, um, <laughs> So, so uh, this, this is a four element feed, and it, it's a four element feed because it had the right beam width to be a feed to then this reflector. So, so, so the reflector ray works like a parabolic dish. So, a parabolic dish uses the geometrical distance from the center of the reflector down to the parabolic surface and then heading straight out. So, this surface has a ground plane and then it has these little metal elements. These, these little, little elements essentially can accept and then retransmit uh, the signal from the feed, and then depending upon the rotation, the outgoing phase can be controlled. Mm. So, so just like a, a parabolic dish, the feed illuminates the surface, and then it constructs an outgoing beam in whatever direction I want, which in this case is just flat, flat parallel, parallel to that surface. Um, so, so when the pointing of the spacecraft Went, went down, down without the reaction wheels. This, this feed antenna was essentially just brought to be flat, and that was just removed. Um, but that was kind of the initial scope of, of this project. And then the nice thing about the reflector is it scales really, really nicely. So the intent was to develop a, a, a framework for using a, just FR4. So this can be printed in, you know, in China for one dollar, basically. Um, and then these. Uh, Substrates, substrates here. Um, so this is just a Rogers substrate, substrate and it's a student. And student Rogers just throws you this for free. Um, and then having this cut out with, you know, by a laser, by a guy in Capitol Hill, um, metrics create space, $200 or $200, whatever it is. So, um, it, you know, it's really, really inexpensive. Um, there is the ANSYS tool, which as a university student, I have for free. But, um, you don't really need ANSYS to even design something like that. So that thing's entirely passive then. Yeah. This, this part is like fully yeah. passive. So, so the nice thing about yeah, the advantage, advantage of reflector rays versus feed fed, fed antennas, like, like typical big phased arrays, is you don't have the losses from the feed network. Um, so, so you essentially have like the feed coming into this antenna, but but those can be pretty efficient. Um, you, you usually have like big losses if you're going to hundreds or thousands of elements because right. especially network. twenty four feet, right? Yeah. Yeah. And that's you know the I guess the new practical approach is to do like PAs everywhere. I'm just behind the elements, um, but, but low, low cost, cost was the, 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 the goal there. Low power too. Yeah, so that doesn't impact your power budget, right? Yeah, yeah. 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 So, so fitting, fitting within the, the CubeSat form, form factor, factor and then power budget, budget and then cost. Um, so those, those are kind of like the top level mission goals. Um, and then kind of having a system that could actually adapt in frequency. So all like the, the RF chain um, can go all the way into the NASA K. K, what they call K-band, so it's like the 25.5 to 27 gigahertz for the near uh, near space for NASA science missions. The little dots you had on there with the yeah. the slots in them yep. look like that, that's what I was seeing. Yep, yep, right? yep. Is there a name for that uh, configuration? Um, I haven't ever seen that. 
I mean, just like double slotted rings. I mean, I mean yeah, there's different, different names. Like that, 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 that specific type of, of reflecting element. element. So that does actually take a lot of emphasis in, in building um, to, to get that tuned right. But but that that's not particularly novel in this. That's already been developed. So there's different types of resonating elements. The simplest would just be a, a square patch. You're essentially changing the resonant frequency of the patch, and that in fact changes with the, the outgoing phases. Um, the nice thing about the the circle uh, elements is you have full phase control, zero to hundred or zero to three sixty. Whereas if you do a a linear patch, you don't have the full the full swing. Um, and then circular polarized helps coming to the atmosphere. Um, so uh, this is this is stock of uh, what's inside of this. Um, so this kind of has. Um, the top, top board, board is the RF board, um, so, so that, that gets its own chamber on the top, and then above the board there's just an RF absorber. Um, so I don't, I don't think I included it, but one one thing, thing here was a microstrip fan pass filter, and that's going to radiate. Um, so, so in the, the RF chain, of course, like harmonics are a huge deal, deal. so putting filters in and getting your output spectrum to be clean was, was, was an emphasis that I was always working towards. So, so then underneath. So everything, everything below this this top PCB um, is in this bottom chamber. So the, the idea, idea there is like let that be noisy if it if it you know if it is because you know it has a digital pressure and whatnot. Um, and then this whole hunk of aluminum acts as a heat sink. So, so the, the unit cannot, cannot stay turned on indefinitely. It, it will overheat. So, so there's a timer and, and the power budget doesn't support it. Um, so, so it, it operates for some amount of time. It, the the components within that RF front end, you know, generating everything before that PDA is like a few watts. So, so it's quite difficult. Um, most of the parts are just like from analog devices. They're the old Hittite components from there with that analog devices bought them. Uh, but it's power hungry. Uh, so I think that's, yeah, bringing it out. OK, so you, but we didn't talk about data. Really. So what? Which, so it looks like 50 megahertz bandwidth. Oh, oh, oh data, data rate. And data rate is. So data rate is. So it, it can go. go it, it can, can transmit sine wave and then increments of BPSK, just encoding um, a simple, you know, hello world type message. Um, it has on board the capability to do one megabit per second. But the ground station for that link budget, we don't have the resources to ever be able to point something that accurately. <laughs> so initially, you know, we, we talked, talked about the kind of the D scope, scope efforts here. We also had, you know, know a larger dish, dish and a one degree uh, pointing, pointing accuracy is an alpha spin, alpha spin rotator. Um, <laughs> and we had problems with it, which is not completely uncommon. It would just flake out on us. You can set it next to mine. <laughs> so we, so we, we, we ended up, you know, going to the G5500 rotator, which is really bomb um, and doesn't have good pointing for this this need. Um, so yeah, when it, when it comes to higher frequency stuff, pointing and then calibration of that pointing is really challenging. Um, and at the university level, like, those aren't resources that we can right. easily get. So, so 50 megahertz, that's what I'm saying? No, so that's... that's that's, That's with all the filters. Um, I mean, yeah, yeah you've got really clever. It has a B200. That's what it could do. But, but we're only allocated um, 24.049 uh, gigahertz center frequency with that uh, a one megahertz. One megahertz. Okay. Gives you that. So, so just sort of in summary, summary here's a couple things that, that, that we think are, are pretty cool about this okay. satellite. Number one, we, we've got the COM1 module built by AMSAT. That's the first uh, AMSAT integration for university partnership. Uh, as far as we're aware, we're also the first university level CubeSat to fly CANBUS, uh, which is, like I said, is pretty common in, in industry and it's just a bit more resilient way to do it. We're the first satellite built by university students in Washington State. <laughs> I mean, I mean that's, that's what people, people like to report on, I guess. I don't, I don't know. know. <laughs> um, but also, uh, everything, almost everything except for the commanding software is open source. So all the flight software code that, that I worked on, all of the, the controls code that does the ADCS is an open source and another repo. Um, all of the PCB designs, whether it's it's Pulse Radio or, or others, just not the AMSAT side of things. 
are, are all on that repo as well. well all of the ground, ground station software uh, uses like extending the, the Ball Aerospace Cosmos, all that config is, is also open source. Um, and you can find it here at our team at UDIP CubeSat. So people seem to be very interested in Impulse Radio, and you can, you can find some more stuff up there. Um, so, so we don't just do satellites. So this was just we wanted to focus on this this mission because we think it's very cool and interesting. But we wanted just to highlight the fact that we have a lot of very talented undergrads, and we, we have a lot of other work that we do. Um, so we do like high altitude balloons for testing on the PPT, but otherwise uh, otherwise testing our software equipment and some ADCS sensors and things. Um, but also just to get people good experience when we have you know like legal times on this, where all the work is just okay, sit down and fill out the paperwork. Now we have all these talented undergrads. We keep them keep them going on things. Um, we're also doing a suborbital payload with Blue Origin. So Blue Blue Origin is contracting uh, with, with Nanorex to do, so like Paige mentioned, the, the structure of the CubeSat is very, uh, it's, it's very highly specified. So there's all these sort of intermediary companies that are hosting CubeSat launches, even for non-satellites. So this is just a pure suborbital launch to test um, the new Shepard rocket. But, but because, because of that, they're flying a 2U farm factor payload. payload. It's, it's not going to go in space, space, but you're able to get power and run experiments and things. And so um, we actually have a lot of folks in the lab that had to miss a meeting for to come here um, that are working on doing electroplating in microgravity, which is actually a very not, not, not really well understood field. So it's really, it's really cool, cool to break even more ground there. Um, as, as well as, as perhaps that too. Well, well, we just, we just got, got one, one up, uh, but we've had a bit of time to think, and we're currently in the design and proposal stage for that. Um, so we're, we're currently just fleshing out our proposal ideas, getting getting out there, getting funding, um, but also like looking for for members and, and sponsorships to to get that project going. Because currently the biggest hurdle I think is is getting a launch. Because as for a satellite, that even at a CubeSat university level, that's that's something that requires grants. I mean, it's not something you can. I, I believe somebody suggested putting it together a bake sale, but I, I don't know how that will work. Um, so, so that's what we're doing now, and just keeping those undergrads involved. And what, what that results in is we have our alumni working at, I just picked like the top third of our roster to, to put on here. Um, but, you know, coming out of this, we have folks working at even Microsoft. I, I saw it. I picked that from somewhere else in the roster. I wanted to throw that up there. Um, but just getting coming out of the lab with all this great experience, PhD level undergrads, just doing this hands on, and I mean, we're, we're, the, the focus was on the science, but but also the focus was on on being an outreach outreach and and undergrad uh, like an engineering and, and research opportunity. I think I think for that uh, I think we've succeeded. So do you have any, you have any questions? questions? Yes. I've got a couple of them. First one has to do with cryptography. Do you encrypt the command and control information that goes over the radio waves? And then the second one has to do with solar phenomena. So pick whichever one you want to talk about first. Um, so just sort of what kind of encryption we have. Right. If any. Um, yes. No. It is. It is uplink is encrypted, and that is dealt with by MSAT. Maybe Paul knows a bit more about that, but I, I don't think we can discuss all everything to do with yeah, that. Yeah. It's it's encrypted, and our downlink is completely unencrypted. So you can actually go to the repo and get Cosmos and decode our data beyond what Fox. So Fox telemetry will decode um, data that that it collects. So it actually has. It's connected to our CAM bus, but it also pulls in analog lines. So we thought, okay, if our CAN bus dies somehow, um, we're, we're going to still get some diagnostics from, from the spacecraft. So we actually have, you know, white wired in lines. So everything in, in Fox telemetry is from, from COM1 in that in that fashion. And then Cosmos is what gets uh, what, what processes everything else. Cool. Yeah, yeah, so, so like, like I mentioned, with the, sort of the two systems, systems almost is so Fox telemetry deals with the AMSATs and everything, things, so getting their telemetry in a very human readable way. Um, but, but there's all there's all the other kinds of specifications to debug or to debug rather um, to parse our data and, and send that out. But it's all open source again, so it just requires a bit of extra work. Um, what was the other piece? Solar phenomena, like shielding and how you protect against solar radiation. Ah, uh, yes. Little mass ejections, solar winds, all that fun stuff. So, so yeah, yeah, we we've had uh, you know. We're aware, we're aware of that, of that. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> but, but uh, the deal is with a lot of our controllers, we can. We're, we're very cognizant of what we put in, um, like NVRAM, basically. Um, so, so we know, know everything. If, if random, random bits get flipped, we on, at least on our side of things, we, we have very fine control over what we can reset, what states we can recover from, and and being very controlled about that. I mean, fundamentally, we're not really flying anything that's rad hard. So, so yeah, I mean, there's only so much we can do, but although we, we have taken some software precautions for that. So we are using the FRAM variant of the MSP430. Um, so FRAM is naturally radiation resistant. Um, and then additionally, we have, okay, so the, the 
the, the lowest, lowest level brain, the distribution um, MSP 430, essentially it will shut anyone off that pulls too much current and then it itself has a little overcurrent protection. So we're protecting against latching of, of individual subsystems as well. So maybe maybe we can't get the lack, catch the lack such that we save that item, but the idea is if something latches, it doesn't take down the whole. And, we, and even if the, um, there's an issue with the CAN bus, that's the sort of the distribution board's job to, to deal with that and it'll detect that something's up and, and do, do our best to rectify it. I mean, fundamentally, we have enough of that. There's nothing we can do, but I mean, we've certainly taken some precautions in that regard. Yeah, but of course, you can do it with pretty friendly orbit. Yeah. Um, oh. You know, it's not like solar winds really affecting us. Mostly, we've seen two resets over the whatever anomaly. Um, yeah, we have seen resets. Um, Three resets. So, so there's yeah, there's resets on. So there's com one resets, but there's also resets on our side. Um, do you know how many? Uh, uh, I've, I've not run the at least not many. six. So yeah, because yeah, everything everything, is, everything stayed yeah. operational during that period. So, so I was especially concerned. Okay. okay. What are the temperature considerations? I mean, you, I'm assuming that maybe, maybe I'm. When you get these pipe that you that you put up there, is that on the circuit board? It's just manufactured like any other circuit board. I mean, does it withstand the temperature, the low temperatures? And secondly, you said parts overheat over there. Is that? I mean, I assume that the environment is four, four degrees Kelvin. Is that correct? No. Okay. It's exactly. actually really cozy. <laughs> okay. It's so cozy that our batteries. Stay between, between like 20, 20 degrees C and, and the highest we've seen is 38. Wow. But, but that's, that's super. So, so, so usually you think about these huge swings. So our, our COM1 module gets up higher. So it might be in like the high 50s and then like 40 C swing. So we're getting like 20 degrees Celsius swings. Now from a design point of view, um, we, you know, you know, we, we did have to worry about, about if a PCB burned, burned a lot of heat, how are we going to dump that heat to the outside? Because that's ultimately, ultimately where you're going to radiate it from. So we have thermal conductors or standoffs. So we did at one point actually use to put down temperature probes in, in a vacuum chamber to actually measure that thermal resistance. And then we use um, any bore that's high power has a two ounce copper pore. Um, or for, for increased thermal conductivity away. And then beyond that, we actually didn't need to do much. So then the COM2 has the highest power dissipating chip, and then it's just essentially being, um, being transferred right into this piece of this hunk of aluminum. But right outside, it's like four degrees Kelvin, right? I mean, well, it's not quite four degrees, because if you, you know, if you're in deep space and there's no sun, Oh, but okay. part of the sky is four degrees, degrees, but then part, part of it is this, you have, you have the reflection, reflection from, from the sun on, from the Earth coming up. So that's why I say it's cozy. Being close enough to Earth when you're in orbit is really cozy. If you get out to geostation near orbit where you're farther away, then it starts to get colder. Okay, so that, te that temperature is really just, I mean, if, if something's up there, it's, it's, it's not like room temperature. Is that what you're telling me? Uh, well, uh, when, it, it, when, it, when you said 20 degrees Celsius, that's yes. Kelvin, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so it's up there. Yes. I mean, the sun is shining on it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And is it on, shining on it all the time, or when you go behind, you get you're in that. Yep. Yep. So in, in, the, in, the, in the eclipse, the temperature will come down. But what we're doing is we're always transmitting power, right? So we have a little heat source. So when we're in the okay. sun, so, so it actually helps that we're continuously just burning a little bit of heat. That's what I was wondering. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. and, and we, we actually have uh, battery, battery heaters. So, so we have little resistive heaters wrapped around the battery, and then we have a temperature sensor on the battery and a little logic control loop that looks at that. But, but, but that's, that's only if we got below zero degrees, so we'll never actually need uh, the battery heaters, which is nice. Yeah, and, yeah, and, and, and so what is the temperature gradient from in, within the thing? It's obviously high up there on the transmitter, right? Yeah, and then, yeah, yeah so, so it's. Something like, like 50, something like 58 might be the highest temperature in the yeah, at the PA of the, the COM1 module. And, and then, then the lowest temperature, the steadiest, is inside at the batteries. So the batteries are like inside and it's a big thermal mass, so they see the least amount of swing. And then we have like a temperature sensor. So actually, we have panel temperature sensors too, but we haven't been able to get that data yet. So they put temperature on the panel so we should actually see swing the most. And so so the the, the boards that generate heat that's that, that obviously there's no air there to conduct heat so it has to go through the 
the, the mm -hmm. mounting. Yep, it's, 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 it's radiative. Okay. Um, well, and it's inside, conduction. Yeah, right. But it doesn't have like it's mounting adaptive. Right. That's, that's why I was talking about the heavy copper cores. So you can move it around to move the thermal. So there's, but then, but then into the environment and from the environment, then it's already. So you can use normal components on these boards, right? You don't have to worry about anything that's being written. It has to be rated down. It you have, 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 have to be conscious. So, so any time, time, so like a general, I was like, any time a given IC dissipates more than like half or three quarters of a watt. If it's less than that, you can ignore it. And that's kind of a, a general rule. So you do have to care. Uh, so, so you don't have to take care about the cold. You won't have to care about the heat. That was what I was surprised. Well, so it, 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 it can be both. And, 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 and bigger, bigger satellites have a much harder time. The fact that this thing is so little, it's easy to get the heat from the source out to the shell without it radiating out into space. You know. Yeah. yeah so, so a big satellite will have to have like a, a heat pipe or or really care about what they're doing from a thermal point of view. Cube sats, we're using you know inexpensive components. We can't draw that much power anyways because we have not much power to deal with. Um, so comps two, the limit was just you know. Only well, we run it for 12 minutes. minutes. So after 12, 12 minutes, minutes, it's toasty. You know, mm -hmm. I, I can warm. You know, it warms up in 12 minutes. It, it can raise like 20 degrees C. Yeah, yeah I mean, from a software point of view, that's sort of because yeah, we have the control the power distribution. It's not, not everything's on all the time. I mean, we can right. control the the components that just pay a lot of heat that way. But also built into our ADCS is we are very slowly tumbling down because we've not commissioned the ADCS. Um, and so that allows us to not have a lot of heat from the sun concentrated in, in sort of one part of the satellite. And even when we do detumble, we're not ever intending to fully detumble. It's just we don't want to spin up. And so that way is we're actually intentionally perturbing the spin of the satellite such that we don't end up with like a, a very um, a centralized point that the sun's heat is coming. Did you uh, have power discussions? Were there trade offs? Did you have to say, I'll buy lunch if you give me a half a megawatt or <laughs> yeah, that's right. yeah, a megawatt? <laughs> <laughs> kilowatt, kilowatt, <laughs> trading around. And, uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. I mean, power budget was a huge thing, and mass budget was. And in the end, we were way under mass budget. So, whenever there's someone developing a cube set, I always tell them, Ignore mass. <laughs> no, really, ignore. It. Make it as thick as you like, can get waivers. And you can get waivers, but we don't even need one. So power is a huge deal. Um, so like the whole idea of why we needed these panels to deploy was to fire the thruster, you know, half a million times. Um, so definitely, it was a it was a big deal. Um, we had a pretty cool scheme at one point where we like while we were firing the thruster, like there'd be like half a second where other things could do stuff. Yeah, yeah. So and then we can get clever about pointing, right? So yeah. if you have reaction wheels, we were gonna do velocity pointing with a secondary vector pointing to the sun. And then this can actually generate about 15 watts. Um, so once you get 15 watts, that's a lot. <laughs> Are other people working on the reaction wheels, or where's what's that? Yeah, um, it's kind of a collaboration, really. I mean, we had folks in our lab working on the, the hardware side of things, but like a lot of the controls were out of the same, out of the same uh, AA controls lab. Yeah, I mean, I think we had a really good plan, but the issue is that the the having state of the art system on a totally student built platform, we're kind of in opposition. Um, and so we just didn't have, you know, there's a reason that the reaction wheel setups or CubeSats from companies are something that they put, you know, several professional engineers on for several years and then sell it to you for, you know, $100,000. Like, um, it's a, it's a much it's hard. Turns out it's more difficult than hard. <laughs> and the hardware, the hardware was really, it wasn't. Um, but is work continuing on it? I would hope. People, people are still, still contemplating the idea. Yeah, yeah they're. <coughs> uh, no, it didn't end up happening. But uh, we did have through. We had one of our our members who's now at Millennium Space Systems uh, for like senior sort of capstone project. Um, was, was getting to, uh, getting back, back at the controls aspect, aspect using an FPGA instead of um, some sort of microprocessor. 
and uh, and that was that was moderately successful. So we had some some work there, and that's still always in the back of our minds. It's the one that got away. You know, we, we got to get these reaction wheels. Um, but so far, uh, there's no plans to apply reaction. So it's the main enemy vibration, or is it temperature swings? What's the biggest challenge actually then for all those mechanical moving parts? Vibration, vibration, I'd say. I mean, yeah, vibration is where we saw the failure. But that's at launch time, right? You mean yeah. Well, no, we would. You, you, but it, it, it is at launch. So the launch, but you vibe before that on a vibe table. Uh -huh. That is a qualification of vibration, so it's higher. You do like a, a test before. Or does it work? You vibe it. You do a test after. Does it work? And it's like no. <laughs> <laughs> One of the other two fail each in their own way. Wow. Um, and then, and then yeah, we, we, we think you know we we understand a little bit of what that failure is, but it just takes a lot of resources. Um, to, to yeah, to make something like that. So I have two questions actually. Uh, the first one was, um, what's the hardest set of paperwork you had to fill out? <laughs> and the second question is, what happens to this? Because you guys are going to graduate, right? You, you are planning to graduate. So. <laughs> but if, what what happens to all of this once you guys are moving on? Do you have replacements or whatever? I mean, so yeah, yeah that's a good. There is uh, one undergrad student who. He was an undergrad student and now he's a grad student and he is kind of the um, there to help with transition, which will be good. Um, and it can spin his uh, graduate research in a way that is useful with CubeSets. Like that may be a good way for that to work. But we have a lot of, we have a good, we have a really good undergraduate um, admin team. Um, and so hopefully as long as we have continue things to look forward to. Uh, it's hard because right now we don't have something that we're building on a large scale like Husky set. Um, so it's, and, until we get a funding or a plan or or something uh, like set, um, you know, there's a, there's a little bit of a competition for the best undergrads to be on the coolest projects. Um, and we don't have the coolest project right now. But hopefully, you know, that team, because they are so good, um, Will, will be able to keep it going, uh, especially with the help of the faculty. What about paperwork? Okay, okay, okay. Um, that is that a is good question. question. I think the scariest one was the NOAA license. I think that, so. <laughs> I had someone, I had someone who was contracted to help me with the FCC license. Um, and so well, that was. A pain because going into it, I had no idea anything about FCC listening. Um, and Paul was really busy during that time. So he helped a lot, but he wasn't there all the time. And then this other guy who was helping was yelling at me, and it was bad. But, um, <laughs> no license, license. they like make, make you sign your life, life away. away. Uh, so, so if you're, you're going to fly a camera in space, space you have to get a license from NOAA. Um, and I don't, I don't know if you guys remember, but back back when Elon Musk did his like Tesla roadster mm -hmm. into space and it suddenly cut out. That, that was because Noah was, was like, you didn't get a license for this right now. Um, so he so, pulled that one. Yeah. Um, wow. So we didn't get a license, and and it's like, I I mean, you've seen so the picture. For, right? a like, <laughs> for a road trip, you wouldn't need one, but for a little cute they, they did. Yeah. 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 Can you explain uh, why they care? Why does it matter? Well, spying, it's control. Right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Yeah. Whatever they say, that's the yeah. reason. Right? Especially because they yeah. don't have a so they can change what they're looking at. So, no, Scott, it's actually more insidious than that. Who controls a collection of oceanography and other Earth-based data? No, it's about competition. I, I am, I, I'm not the most jaded attorney you'll ever. <laughs> but I believe that I end up on the. Uh, the I was going to say I end up on the. Uh, the list of the top 10 most jaded. So. Yeah, the propulsion of a device in space seems like a weapon. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, I mean, honestly, so that seems scary. I get that. The, the most that had to obtain the propulsion system, apart from to the, the NASA safety team, they were pretty key on that. But the other people, NOAA, was like the only other place that I really had to defend and explain exactly what no, not and the how the commands went to it, and what the you know what the command structure was, and how secure that was, and I might have called into the camera. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and then, no. you know, again, they're like, here are all the penalties if you. Someone managed to something that they build a, you know, 10 <laughs> kilometer ground sampling distance. Yeah, yeah well. Which, yeah. 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 There's, so, and that's one thing, um, you know, that's what I'm fighting for that a lot of people are fighting for with this 
um, you know, you know increase the number of, of launches. They're trying to get because everything goes through the same process, right? Um, there's not like a this camera is crappy. It's, it's, you know, you care. if you yeah. won't know if it takes a picture of this country, you know? like, there are regulations about that. You can't. Yeah. Looking down from space into um, the ocean. And uh, so, yeah, 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 so is it. Yeah, if you want, like, if you want it's pictures of Israel, you have to buy them from the French. French. <laughs> 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 There's a couple of different things. I like to buy them from America. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah. Uh, there's also the, the NASA, NASA safety paperwork because we're originally going to be on the ISS and we're going to be like, physically handled by an astronaut no, to get. We're never, never going to do that? That was, that was like certainly a consideration that I was talking about. We no. decided that we couldn't. We basically. Oh, so certainly with the safety. No, we definitely could have passed that. I just. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't see what it would take. But if you want to actually go onto the space station and be touched by astronauts, you have to like prove a certain smoothness to like all of your satellite. <laughs> possibly cut to you on. Yeah. No, we were never going to pass that. So it had to look like an <laughs> egg. This solar was not going to. A little yeah. covered egg. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't cut myself picking up that model to put in my bag earlier today. That's not true story. So, so, yeah, so yeah, yeah, I guess, uh, I mean, the FCC paperwork was probably the hardest to get together and get right with the NOAA paperwork. It's like, it's right. Now wow. I've signed my paperwork. Yeah. So, if this wasn't the coolest project, what was? It's you mentioned, over. You mentioned it's this. It's over. The project's Project over. Still wow. operating. Well, yeah, it's not yeah. over. It's still well, no, I mean, you mentioned you weren't building the coolest project that, that oh, they've no, done. No, no. So no anymore. Oh, okay. oh, I see. Um, you know, oh, okay. the university has several interesting groups. And, and so until we're, we're actually, again, building something that might go into space, space there are other options, options that they might want to build, a, you know, a robot car instead or something. Um, That's already been done. That's boring. Competitions where you get validated in a way that. So is that roughly the timeline for Husky yeah. Sat 2 is about a four year? It doesn't have to be. You, you know, can hope for something have, shorter. We just had no idea what we were going to do. Right. Just go around. Um, and now, now we have a lot better idea. We have the ground station set up. We have all this. You know, we have a room where we have a lot of test equipment. We've done a lot of testing back on. Um, a a two-year cadence, I think, is achievable. Yeah. yeah. So even with, because it sounds like the hardest thing is catching the ride, right? Yeah, but I mean, there's, there's more rides. Okay. Yeah. And that's, that's, okay, so really it's yeah. the money we, we that's there. We got offered a $70,000 launch for a three-year cadence. Yeah. 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 That's not your price, just to be clear. I understand <laughs> it's cheap. Yeah. Yeah. So as a university, you have access to a bit more type of launch opportunities. Um, yeah. 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 So, so, so can we put you down for a talk in exactly two years? <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't want to sign up. You know, yeah, I'm not going to be there. <laughs> 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 That's called delegation. <laughs> So how many satellites are up there, or stuff is up there? I mean, how, what's the quantity of stuff that's there? Like, there's, there's a catalog. Is there? Like, like, in the, do you need a spiral bound, and do you have it in your office? <laughs> <laughs> it's in the cloud, uh, and it's, it's big. Is it hundreds or thousands? Like thousands. 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 Yeah. Thousands. More than 7,000. Yeah. 7,000? More than 7,000. Space jump is about 1,700, I agree. Right. And that's pieces that are big enough to to matter, not just little screws. There's some database of NASA that's track 17. I'm sorry? There's some database of all the objects circling the Earth, I think. So when, it goes up when, to 2 million objects. When this goes up. It's starting to very small. Yeah. All the key yeah. figures, not yeah. yeah. So, so all CubeSats currently uh, have this like sort of artificial thing where they say you have to prove that you will deorbit within 25 years. Um, that's just what's going on right now. I think that'll end up changing as it gets more and more populated with the commercial, commercial satellites. Um, we're going, going in the orbit that we're going into that low at 465. We're going to do a big issue. Uh, so, you know, we're not considered a big issue because we got gone in 
computer years or so. Um, you do anything in those lower orbits. Once you get above, once you get above 600 kilometers, and start staying up. So are there are there like uh, orbits or areas where you you can go, or is it a, is it a probability that you're going to run into something or not, or are there spaces you can go where you're just not going to run into something, or is it all probability? So, so I mean, all the orbits end up not all, all of the orbits. A lot of the orbits end up crossing each other. So one sort of crowded orbit is. Like, like geosynchronous, um, because that's at a very particular distance. Um, and then, you know, you know Lower Earth is getting a little crowded with all the, <laughs> all the Starlink launches um, <laughs> and all the proposed <laughs> launches. There's a the EGI um, put, put a nice video together about all the proposed, you know, within the next 10 years, if all the proposed. And these are huge constellations, yeah. tens of thousands of them. Yeah. Well, the Project Piper is going to be on the road, and they're planning <laughs> several thousand. Wouldn't that cool the Earth? It'll cool the Earth. We'll be doing a telescope to see that. So, yeah, there are several that we'll be getting crowded. Um, so, it's, it's, it's big. big. It's right. just once things start, uh, I don't know if it was five years ago that it was a thing, but it was... Uh, uh, I'm like, it's some number project um, that was interested in, in removing space junk type stuff, and they had a nice animation where if, you know, two big enough satellites collide in an orbit that's popular, like, that's just going to chain. That, that's a problem. Um, so like right now, probabilities are still pretty low, but if that was, you know, two big enough satellites in a popular orbit, that could take out this. Uh, which, which is why uh, there's, there's been, been it's, it's actually really interesting, and I don't have most up-to-date information, but, you know, for the last 10 years, there's been a lot of thought about how to remove space debris, um, but no one's done anything <laughs> because of the implications of being able to take a satellite out of orbit. Um, who owns that satellite? Who gets to decide when you take it down? And what happens if you take down someone else's satellite? So, so uh, I think we're getting to the point where that's going to be sufficiently necessary to figure out how to do that. If only he had a small port, small satellite that was pointable and steerable, could do that. Laser them all out for us. Good follow. Question? Yeah. Hi, one more. When you when you eject it from the, you get up there and then you eject it out. There are other things that are being ejected yeah. out, and do they just kind of slowly drift away from each other? And that's kind of the, at least that's spring. what you hope, right? Uh, yeah, if you're, if you're with another person, like right on top, there's a little spring in between you. So yeah, yeah there's a little bit of velocity difference, and then the differential drag is high enough where like you'll start to separate. So yeah, we were we were launching that clump, and then now we've spread out. And the fact that you fire this little, uh, in, this little engine uh, to that doesn't significantly alter that. Is that well, what you're we haven't fired it yet. So, so it could significantly alter that. You hope it will. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah so you have, even if you have a very small difference in velocity, once you integrate that over several days of orbits, then you start to get more. Right. But, but then, of course, if, <coughs> if the guy who's launched behind you, if he has one of those little things now, you have to do all this coordination. So yeah, yeah, I mean, we've been like, like talking with the people that watch this, <coughs> and they're like, you know, you know we think we're, we're this object, object, and then we go, well, we think that we're, we're this one. one. And then there's like, like well, well, out of, you know, illumination, I must be this. <laughs> so then there's a lot of like this initial, who, who am I up there? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes. Science. Well, if you can <laughs> aim yours right <laughs> at them, <laughs> you can bump, bump them around. Bump the cars. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think, I think the, the, the Best example of a satellite mishap is the uh, one satellite. I think it had a permanent magnet on board. And it ended up attaching it. Oh, my. Sticky, yeah. The other satellite had a really good ADCS system, then that. I guess that's why they call it passive ADCS, yeah. Velcro <laughs> would have done the same thing. <laughs> So the, 
So, so the sulfur system does not right. require any I'm curious like how it how it reacts when you're testing it here are you doing this all in a vacuum because it obviously has, it reacts yeah, differently so, I mean, air, so with, right? with plasma um basically what you know plasma is a, it's a neutral net neutral thing and so it's basically just you know you take gas, gas and you add energy and you separate your electrons and your ions once you've separated your electrons from your from your positive heavy ions you can influence the electric and magnetic field and that's how you accelerate them um, because you're doing the electromagnetic um, or just electric, depending on how your system works. Uh, and and so, so if, if you're in air, those, those electrons and ions are just going to collide with atoms, and they won't be ionized anymore. So you can't, you can't actually keep a plasma, plasma around for long enough to use it as a propulsion unless you're in a fairly, fairly good vacuum. Yeah. So, so all your testing was done um, at that so then, does, does the spacecraft become ionized as a result of the... So it is a net neutral plasma. Um, so that is, oh, an issue. Yeah, that is an issue with other types of thrusters. And so then, because um, in other types of thrusters, they're just expelling the ions. And so then they have to have an, ex an external cathode that then spits out electrons. Right. Um, but yeah, I Are you able to update this software? <laughs> You flash it. No, I really wanted to get that in at, at one point, but especially for the, I don't even think it would have been possible hardware wise, but especially for the, the legal implications that just sort of was well out. But I mean, there are there are some, there's some talk about doing that on the, on the next launch. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, uh, one of our thank, thank yous you. to our speakers is you guys get to pick a dinner on us. Um, uh, Wherever you'd like to go. Yeah, in the end.